guess one of the first things as a soil scientist, one of the first things that I like to do when I come into a field, particularly if there's a question about some issue related to low productivity, you know, what's, what's wrong with this field, I like to dig a soil pit. And so what I have here is a soil pit that actually shows the soil profile, uh, the A horizon, which is the topsoil, which is about 10 centimeters deep, a B horizon below that, uh, which is about another 10 or 15 centimeters deep, and then followed below that, to A and B horizon is what's called a C horizon or the parent material and if I just hold up bring up some of that parent material. The parent material in Saskatchewan is typically a whitish color because of the presence of, of calcium carbonate and sometimes that parent material and in this case it's the case also contains some salts. So uh, knowing about what's what your soil is in terms of how thick that A horizon is can tell you something about uh, the ability how much organic matter you've got its ability to release uh, uh, nutrients into available forms for the plants and also knowing for example if you have something like sulfate down deeper in the profile or a large amount of nitrate, that's important to know because that nitrate and sulfate can move with water moving to the roots. So although we tend to concentrate when we soil sample and sometimes, uh, you know, concentrate on that topsoil in terms of, of determining how much nutrient is in it, how much organic matter is in it, uh, it's always a good idea to go a little bit deeper sometimes to find out what's, what's, what's down in there because it can contribute to available nutrient as well. So that's a look at, at, the, at the importance of consistency considering vertical distribution of nutrients. The other aspect of important, uh, important in soil sampling to get a representative sample of the area that you're intending to sample is the kind of variability you might encounter uh, across the field or even on a smaller scale because there can be large variations in available nutrients even over only a few feet in the field. Especially in our modern cropping systems where we're using low disturbance or zero till uh, farming system, seeding and fertilizing system where we have a seed row and there's probably some residual fertilizer in the seed row at the end of the season. There might even be some residual fertilizer in a side row band or a mid row band and that can create a lot of variability in available nutrient over a short distance. And as you can imagine if we just took our samples from the old fertilizer of the seed rows, we'd overestimate the available nutrient in the field. Similarly, if we always took our soil samples from areas where the fertil far away from where the fertilizer was, we'd underestimate it. So in a sampling strategy for a no-till field, uh, what we found is that what can work best is actually if you take a slab or a slice of soil across those seed and fertilizer rows, maybe 30 to 50 centimeters, and then take that slab and combine the soil together, and that will give you a pretty good idea of the availability of nutrients in that uh, area of the soil and help account for that large degree of variability that can occur over small distances, especially in no-till fields, because you don't have that kind of mixing taking place where we used to have where we tilled the soil. And and mixed it up. I guess the other important thing to take into consideration is the kind of variability that you see over larger distances that's related to topography. The fact that knolls tend to oftentimes be lower in fertility because they have lower organic matter content, they may have been eroded, whereas the depressional areas are areas where water has moved soil and tillage has moved nutrient rich topsoil into those depressions tend to have higher fertility. So in a field that has a a lot of variable topography, a lot of knolls and a lot of depressions, maybe some differences in the, in the sand and silt and clay content can be very large variations in fertility over or in, 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 within that field. And you need to take a lot of cores in order to account for that variability. So some recent research work that, that I was involved in at the University of Saskatchewan really showed that uh, over a 10 acre area you needed to have as many as, as, as 60 cores taken in order to, to, to truly get a good estimation of the average level across that field area. So I guess what, what we conclude really is that you know soils are very variable on a small scale, on a larger scale, and we need to take lots of samples in order to account for that variability and get a good idea uh, if we're going to get a good idea of what the average level is in an area. And what more people are moving towards now is what's called uh, precision uh, or variable rate to fertilization where zones are identified within the field based on a yield map, 
top on satellite imagery and some t or based on soil analysis, either taking samples of soil or even doing some type of a remote measurement. So the field is divided into different zones and then samples of soil may be taken from within that zone. The same type of rules apply though. You can't just take one sample of soil and say that it represents that area. You need to take some, 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 some separate samples, uh, cores or slabs from that area and combine them together if you're going to represent that area. Can you talk a little bit about handling the soil sure. samples afterwards? Yeah. Once the sample comes uh, comes out of the field, proper sampling or proper handling of that sample very important to preserve it in the state in which it's removed from the field. So, for example, one way of preserving that sample after it's taken out of the field is laying it out to dry, air dry, we call it, at maybe 30 degrees centigrade in a warm room with a fan blowing. And a and after that soil is dried, basically microbial activity is is reduced. It's slowed down greatly, so that you can have ha take that sample goes to a lab, spends three or four days in transit, uh, spends some time in the lab, the nutrient levels aren't going to change much from, from when it came out of the field. Another strategy that can be used is to freeze that sample. Uh, and uh, uh, as it comes out of the field, put it in the freezer, and then before analysis, then it's thawed out. And what we're really trying to do if we're drying the soil or we're freezing the soil is we're trying to stop microbial activity. If you took the soil out of the field, it's wet, and you put it in the trunk of your car where it's uh, 30 or 40 degrees uh, Celsius, it's warm, it's moist, those are perfect conditions for microorganisms to grow. So they're going to be acting, they're going to be releasing available nutrient, they might be tying it up, they're going to be changing the level in that soil compared to what it actually exists out in the field. So dry or freeze to basically preserve that soil as much as possible in the state that it came out of the field. In research purposes, we really don't like to deal with samples that have been, for example, air dried or put into a refrigerator at four degrees, you can put them in a refrigerator at four degrees. That'll slow down the microbial activity, but it won't stop it. So samples have been hanging around for a few months in a refrigerator. Mm, generally, we question the reliability of any type of analysis for available nutrients that might come out of those samples. Is it better to take a sample in the spring right before seeding? Uh, generally, the closer the time the sample can, is taken to the time of crop demand, the more reliable. Because if you take a sample too much far in advance, environmental conditions, you know, heavy rains or, or something can, 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 can leach away nutrient or can cause them to volatilize depending on the nutrient. And so what you have in that sample doesn't really rec represent what the crop, crop, crop is going to see. That being said, some nutrients in the soil like phosphorus, potassium, a lot of the micros don't change much. Uh, over time, so you can sample in advance uh, with those and, and feel fairly comfortable. Nitrate nitrogen is one that actually is quite variable, uh, both spatially and, and also over time. Uh, Closer to the time of seeding better, but what a lot of growers do is they will take their samples in the fall, understandably, and, uh, and they want to get that information on their nutrient availability so that they can do their fertilizer planning, their crop nutrition planning uh, well in advance and use that to decide how much fertilizer they, they want to bring in onto their farm before the busy season in the spring. And sometimes fertilizer prices are, are, are cheaper in the fall than they are in the <laughs> spring too, so yeah. there's some incentive for, for... So consequently, a lot of this sampling and analysis does get done in the fall. Thank <music> you.